This is Siberia. I expect you think that the whole of the Soviet Union is like this in winter. But this is a special place even by Russian standards. It's Yakutia in northeastern Siberia. And the coldest place in the northern hemisphere. We have recorded temperatures here as low as minus 70 degrees centigrade. That's 126 degrees of frost on the Fahrenheit scale. Today is quite warm. It's only minus 40. Even so, my breath freezes instantly, and I have to wear thick furs to save myself from dying of cold. Amazing that any small creatures can survive these temperatures. And yet, incredibly, some animals live right through the Siberian winter. This is one of them. It's a Siberian marmot. It's cold and stiff, but it's not dead. It's simply hibernating, and if I warmed it up, it would come to life. But the kinder thing to do is to let it sleep for another few months. Hibernating is just one way of surviving the winter, but as you'll see, there are many others. Wolves and their prey are active right through the winter. Their thick fur keeps them warm, but like everything else that lives here, they are close to the limits of survival. The wolf is part of the image of Russia. It features in lots of our childhood stories, haunting the endless forests and dragging travelers from their troikas. In fact, wolves are usually harmless to people, but the forests do seem endless. A sea of conifers stretches almost unbroken from the Baltic in the west to the shores of the Pacific in the east. It's the greatest forest in the world, spanning 6,000 miles and 11 time zones. We call this frozen forest the taiga. Siberia is drained by three great rivers, Yenisei, Ob, and Lena, flowing 2,500 miles north to the Arctic Ocean. For half the year, they are locked solid by ice. Winter in these forests lasts for up to eight months. The northern edge of the taiga is mostly large. It's best able to resist the intense cold. But south, towards the foothills of the Altai, the forest is richer. Spruce, fir, and pine predominate, with a few deciduous trees, such as birch. Many of these trees are very slim, the better to shed snow from their branches. These forests shelter one of Siberia's most enigmatic creatures. It's the musk deer. This one's a male, distinguished by its remarkable tusks, elongated canine teeth. Musk deer are the source of the musk used in perfumes. Only the males produce musk. They use it for marking their territories. The glands, or pods, that secrete musk are worth more than their weight in gold. So over much of their range, musk deer have been hunted almost to extinction. Siberia is their last stronghold. The musk deer's staple diet is lichen. These South Siberian forests are wetter than the northern taiga and trees are often festooned with luxuriant growth. Where there are a lot of deer and territories are small, all the lichen within easy reach is soon eaten.
the deer are skilled at clambering into the branches to reach new supplies, though sometimes they get more than they bargained for. Siberia's forests are vast, but they are far from deserted. In the 16th century, Russian colonists crossed the Urals and forged east. Lured by Siberia's rich resources, they reached the Pacific in little more than a hundred years. The most prized of those riches was fur, wool and lynx, ermine, mink and sable. In those days, furs weren't worn just for fashion, but to keep warm, like the animals they were taken from. Today, most people live in cities, but there is still a scattered peasant population. It's a hard land to rest a living from, no more so than in winter. People and their livestock are dependent on supplies gathered during the brief Siberian summer. For the wild creatures of the forest as well, laying in supplies for the winter is the key to survival. Where there is layers of fat on a hibernating bear or marmot, or as stores of some other kind. By November, only the last remnants of the fruits of autumn hang frozen from the branches. Birds, such as jays and nutcrackers, are breaking into their winter stores, Siberian pine cones buried weeks before. The nut-like seeds of the Siberian pine play a vital role in the economy of the frozen forest. They are one of the richest sources of food in autumn, and they are easily stored. Fluffed up against the cold, even small birds like tits can find enough to survive the winter, hunting through twigs and dead leaves for torpid insects. These are no ordinary dead leaves. They've been sewn together with silk by hibernating caterpillars. Inside this homemade tent, they are sheltered from the chilling wind. Not only do they bind the leaves together, they tie them to the twigs with a silken thread. And that keeps them up in the branches, where the green leaves of spring will give the caterpillars their first meal after the winter. The forest has readied itself for winter too, the cedar trees, like larch, have shed their needles. They are less likely to hold crippling weights of snow. Evergreens, like pine, run the risk of being bent and bowed down. At the extremes of temperature the taiga can experience, frozen stems can shatter with the cold. But they are not without their defenses. Their tissues have a powerful antifreeze, which stops the cells being ruptured by ice crystals. Close to the Arctic Circle, the midwinter sun barely climbs above the horizon. Above the snow, little stirs, always gripped in unimaginable cold.
In burrows deep beneath the snow, marmots are hibernating. Their body temperature is only about 4 degrees, and their hearts are beating less than once a minute. But once a fortnight, they wake up to urinate. It takes them four hours to bring their temperature up to its usual 36 degrees. And during the process, their heart rate rises to an incredible 300 beats a minute. After a few hours, they'll go back to sleep again. They spend eight months of the year in this torpid state. Chipmunks are hibernating too, but they wake up every four days. And unlike marmots, they've stored supplies of food in their burrows. They're too small to lay down enough fat to see them through the winter, so they have to wake up at intervals to feed. It's a risky process. The strain of raising their bodies from near freezing to working temperature sometimes kills them. But if they didn't do it, they'd starve to death long before the spring. Food alone isn't enough for survival. They store ice in the burrow as well for moisture. Red-backed voles stay active right through the winter, foraging beneath the snow for berries and lichen. When they're not feeding, they retreat to a warm nest lined with dry vegetation. In summer, these rodents are pugnacious and solitary, but now they curb their aggressive instincts and huddle together for warmth. In the dry taiga of northeast Siberia, there are seldom any great depth of snow. In these shallow runways, they are vulnerable. A great gray owl. Its hearing is so acute that it can actually pinpoint voles moving beneath the snow. Other hunters are abroad. An airman in its warm white winter coat. And most remarkable of all, a tiny shrew. It weighs only three to five grams, and it has to feed at least once an hour. It's active right through the winter. Most of the time, it's beneath the insulating layer of snow, hunting for frozen insects. But when it's exhausted all the food in one place, it comes to the surface and risks temperatures far below zero to run to pastures new. By April, the sun is climbing higher in the sky, though it's still bitterly cold. Among the first birds to nest is the Siberian jay. The female lays her eggs when there's still snow on the ground. It's so cold that she can't leave the nest even for an instant. 
Her mate has to feed her. And by the time the eggs hatch, she's so hungry that she'll even grab food destined for her chicks. By nesting so early, the jays take advantage of spring's first spiders and insects. And when their chicks fledge, other birds will just be hatching their young. By May, the snow has melted from the low-lying ground. But beneath the surface, the earth is still frozen. This is the permafrost. It sets the northern limits to the forest. Not far beyond the Arctic Circle, the ground never thaws deep enough to let trees put down roots. The permafrost stops meltwater draining away. It holds it on the surface as bogs and pools. The pools are staging posts for migrant waders on their way north and for others that will stay here to nest, like these wood sandpipers. Within days of the thaw, the pools come alive. Creatures that have been locked solid in ice for months renew their activities. Dragonfly and water beetle larvae, even fish. By late May, the evening sun barely dips below the horizon. It's then that one of the taiga's strangest rituals is enacted. As daylight fades, black-billed capercaillie gather at traditional display grounds, places where the forest floor is flat and open. Capercaillie are about the size of turkeys. The birds that are calling are males. As many as 20 may gather at these tournaments. They display first in the treetops. Then the older cocks move down to the ground. Each has his own small territory. He patrols its border, displaying to rival males. Most of this is just bluff, though sometimes it ends in a fight. And this is what it's all about, attracting a mate. As soon as a hen appears, the cocks redouble their efforts, trying to lure her onto their territory and mate with her. Soon after sunrise, the capercaillie disperse. Although the snow has gone, Arctic hares have yet to lose their white winter coats. Now the ground's unfrozen. They can dig for roots and tubers. All through winter, they've had nothing to eat but bark and twigs. It's a wonder that any trees grow here.
in a week or two, their coats will turn gray. But for now, they are conspicuous targets for hunters like golden eagles. Eagles usually produce two eggs, but they start sitting as soon as the first is laid. That means that one egg hatches before the other, so one chick is always a bit larger. Sooner or later, the older chick attacks its smaller, weaker sibling. Even though there may be food on the nest, it hurries it relentlessly. It won't stop until its unfortunate nestmate is killed or driven over the edge. This happens in four nests out of five. It looks brutal, but it will mean more food for the surviving chick. In Siberia's hard economy, it greatly increases the parents' chances of rearing at least one young. Only exceptionally, is there enough food in these savage surroundings for two chicks to be raised. The eaglet's mother has got a willow grouse. The survivor will have it all to itself and grow all the faster. In the short Siberian summer, it's a race against time to fledge before the return of the cold. Although it's almost June, the larch in which the eagles nest shows only the first hint of fresh green needles. Down below, anemones are pushing through the soil, the first flowers of spring. On the Lena River, the ice is breaking. A cavalcade of ice flows, five miles wide, grinds its way north to the Arctic Ocean.
thousand miles and more to the southwest, not far from the headwaters of the Lena, lies one of the wonders of Siberia. Lake Baikal. Baikal is a place of superlatives. It's very big, 400 miles long and up to 50 miles wide. It's very deep. It lies in the trench of a rift valley. And in places, there's more than a mile of water beneath the ice. That makes it the deepest lake in the world. So the volume of water it contains is enormous. An incredible 20% of all the fresh water in the world is here in Baikal. It's very old, more than 20 million years old. That makes it by far the planet's most ancient lake. And because it's so old and it's isolated from other lakes, many of the creatures that live in its waters are unique. As the ice flows shatter and decay, life begins to stir. Rising from the depths, a myriad creatures crawl upwards through the ice. Caddis flies. There are at least 20 different kinds on Baikal. Most are fully winged and they are good flyers. But in a few, the wings are vestigial. They skim around on the surface like pond skaters in search of a mate. This explosion of insect life gives birds such as wagtails a welcome spring feast. Sometimes the caddies swarm in unbelievable numbers. In the cool of the evening, caddies flies make for the shore. They cluster together under rocks. It's still freezing hard at night. Here, they are sheltered from the chill wind, and by clumping together, they increase their chances of surviving till dawn without being frozen. But it leaves them vulnerable to another danger. Bears. For Baikal's brown bears, the caddis season is a bonanza. It's their first chance to stock up on protein after the winter. All along the shore, they come out of the woods to gorge themselves on this unlikely banquet. These tiny cubs would have been born when their mother was still in her winter's den. It's their first picnic on the beach.
the caddy's fly feast brings unusual concentrations of bears together. For the cubs, that has its dangers. Male bears sometimes kill young cubs. The cub's mother leads them back to the safety of the woods. The last ice flows don't melt till mid-June. Baikal's water is a huge reservoir of cold, and it has a profound influence on the surrounding forest. Further away from the lake, spring came weeks ago. But only now are these birch and poplars putting out new leaves. On the forest floor, beginnings bloom. Some of our garden kinds came originally from Siberia. By now, the snows on the mountains around have melted. It's said that 365 rivers flow into Baikal. One for each day of the year. Baikal has very few islands. In most places, the shore plunges steeply to the depths. But ten miles off the northeast coast lie the Ushkeni Islands. In midsummer, it's here that some of the lake's most famous residents gather. Baikal seals. They are the smallest of the seals and one of only two freshwater kinds. They're more than a thousand miles from the nearest ocean. Their ancestors must have swum up one of the great Siberian rivers and been landlocked here in Baikal. There are some 60,000 of them altogether. They come to the Ushkeni Islands to mold. Space is at a premium. All the best places on the rocks are soon taken. You are more likely to be tolerated if you give your neighbor a good scratch. Beneath the surface, Baikal is unique. Freshwater sponges that stand as high as a man luxuriate in the shallows. The 
sponge forests shelter creatures found nowhere else in the world. Corted fish, for instance, are unique to Baikal. Because the lake has been isolated for so long, they've evolved dozens of different kinds. For the evolutionary biologist, Baikal is the Galapagos of Siberia. Over 20 million years, the lake's original colonists have diversified into a huge variety of forms. This match-head-sized crustacean is called the Baikal horse. Wherever it goes, it carries two tiny boulders, perhaps as camouflage or ballast. These are omu, Baikal's most prized fish. They came originally from the Arctic. They are members of the salmon family and very good to eat. Each autumn, massive shoals run up the rivers to spawn. To see Baikal's strangest creatures, we must go deeper. This is Pisces. It's a kind of submarine designed for deep ocean research. But now it's working here on Baikal, helping to unlock the secrets of the planet's deepest lake. Now they are just going to launch it, and I'm going to join the crew. In 1990, an international group of scientists gathered on Baikal to study the bed of the lake. A unique and privileged opportunity, and one that we are about to share. It's very cramped inside here. There's barely room for three of us. We can stay down for more than eight hours. But after one hour, the humidity will rise to 100% and we'll get really cold. But now we are ready to go. Now we are at the bottom of the lake. There's a video camera mounted outside. We can see its pictures on this screen. Most of the lake bed is fine mud, 20 million years of silt. In places, it's five miles thick. You could bury Mount Everest in the mud at the bottom of Baikal. It's only just about freezing down here and completely dark. Ours is the first light these creatures have ever seen. Strange fish and crustaceans people the depths. Unlike in most deep lakes, there's plenty of oxygen down here. No plants can live in this blackness. Everything is dependent on the rain of detritus falling from above. Scavenging fish wait patiently for a meal to sink to them.
that's a golomanka, a gelatinous transparent fish found only in the depth of Baikal. Where there's rock to anchor them, Baikal's unique freshwater sponges penetrate far into the darkness. It's a world all of its own, and one still with many secrets. By September, the first snows of winter powder the mountains around Baikal. Autumn is a time to harvest the fruits of the forest. Collecting mushrooms is a tradition with us Russians. We call it Tiche Achota, the quiet hunt. And it's not just country people that do it. Every autumn, city dwellers go out into the woods around Moscow and our other big cities to gather mushrooms. There are at least 36 different edible varieties. We dry the mushrooms in the sun and store them for the winter. In times of shortages, they are a welcome addition to our diet. The forest's wild creatures are laying in supplies for winter too. Jays and nutcrackers are gathering Siberian pine nuts. Chipmunks cram their cheek pouches. They'll store the nuts in the burrows where they spend the winter. Even our Russian bears take advantage of this final flush of food. They must lay down enough fat to last through the long winter's sleep. It's a race against time to gather enough for survival, and a race you can't afford to lose. In Siberia's harsh economy, only the thriftiest will see next year's spring. Soon, this realm of the Russian bear will fall silent. The bitter chill of the long Siberian winter will again take its icy grip on the frozen forest. From Siberia, our coldest region, to our far east, which includes Kamchatka, 
one of the most volcanically active parts of the world. It's also the realm of our biggest Russian bears. I hope you'll join me here on the last stage of our journey. So until then, goodbye, Dovstrich.